could probably still dream of what could be. We did. We do. And while many thought we were through, no. We've been learning. We've been building. We've been training. And now, it's time. Because the next frontier is not just for the next generation. It's for this generation. It's for me, and it's for you. For everything we still dream about. We go as Artemis. Good morning. I'm Vanessa White, Deputy Director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm excited to kick off the graduation celebration this morning. We have a great day ahead of us. And since this is our first gathering of 2020, I want to point out the tremendous and historic year that is ahead for Houston and our center. For the first time in nine years, we will launch people from American soil. Yeah. <laughs> commercial partners and our NASA team is working to ensure that our spacecraft and our launch vehicles are ready to go and that we will launch our astronauts in 2020. Our crew members on board the International Space Station are continuing to complete research, test new technology, and do external spacewalks, including three spacewalks that are planned this month. And we continue to rapidly progress along our exploration goals in Artemis. We will have a lot to celebrate this year. 2020 is going to be exciting, and the celebration starts today. So please allow me to introduce the director of NASA's Johnson Space Center, Mr. Mark Geyer. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. You know, and welcome everyone. What a great day. This is indeed a big day for the Johnson Space Center, big day for NASA, for Houston and the nation. Johnson Space Center has led the world in human space flight for more than 55 years, and these days we are busier than ever. We take responsibility for the welfare and performance of our nation's astronauts, and we take that very seriously. Through our work at JSC, American and international astronauts have been continuously working and living in space on the International Space Station for almost 20 years. And now we are preparing to send astronauts further into space than ever before. I would, allow, I would now like to recognize a few of our very distinguished guests joining us here today. I'd like to start with Senator Ted Cruz. Texas Representative Dennis Paul. And then I would like to uh, also, we have many representatives from offices of Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, Congressman Michael McCall, Congressman Randy Weber, Congressman Bob Brian Babin, Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher, people, uh, members of the city of Houston, and also officials from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. We also have representatives from the United States Marine Corps, United States Space Force, and the Royal Canadian Air Force. So thank you all for coming here and joining us today. So two years ago, two years ago, this group of new astronauts arrived here at Johnson for the very first time. And they already came in with very impressive resumes, but now they have become part of an elite group elite group of people qualified for space flight and ready to train for the exciting missions ahead. Uh, but like all folks that come here to work, they are now part of our family, the NASA and Johnson Space Center family. We're proud of them and excited for them, and they really deserve this day. They are beginning a journey that will take them on voyages of exploration like humankind has never seen before. Now it's my honor to, to introduce several people that are on stage with me. First, Johnson Space Center Deputy Director Vanessa Weish. Chief of the NASA Astronaut Office, Pat Forster. Yeah. 
NASA astronaut Reed Weissman. And Canadian Space Agency astronaut Jeremy Hansen. And now it's my honor to welcome and introduce NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Well, thank you so much, Mark, and thank you for the amazing work you're doing here at the Johnson Space Center. I know just maybe a decade ago, there was a lot of, a lot of challenges happening um, as the space shuttle was being retired, as the Constellation program got canceled. Uh, but I can tell you because of your hard work, Mark, and so many others, and of course, bipartisan support in the House, bipartisan support in the Senate, um, NASA is making a significant comeback. Our budgets are going up, and Mark, you're doing all the right things to help this center be successful in that effort. So thank you, Mark. <laughs> it is my pleasure to be here today to honor our newest class of astronauts. This is a very exciting day, not only for these impressive men and women, but it's an also incredibly exciting day for our nation and for, in fact, all of humanity. Today, 13 men and women from NASA and our partners at the Canadian Space Agency are graduating from their basic training and joining the active astronaut corps. They represent the first wave of NASA's Artemis generation astronauts. I want to repeat that. This is the Artemis generation, and this is the first class of the Artemis generation astronauts. <laughs> Artemis is a bold new vision in space exploration uniting the international community. In addition to expeditions on the International Space Station, these astronauts could one day, in fact, walk on the moon as a part of the Artemis program, and per perhaps one of them could be among the first humans to walk on Mars. <laughs> Their trailblazing triumphs will transform humanity's presence in our solar system and forever change life here on Earth. In short, they represent the best of humanity and our most fervent hopes for the future. <laughs> no pressure. <clears throat> Without further ado, let's welcome the world's newest astronauts to the stage. of a better way to kick off 2020 than honoring this class. What a year for them to join the Corps. 2020 will mark the return of human spaceflight launches with American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. It will also be an important year of progress for our Artemis program our mandate to return to the moon and to get ready for Mars. The title of astronaut has always carried a sense of sweeping excellence. This excellence is earned every day through a rare combination of meticulous effort. Our graduates today have demonstrated uncommon focus, uncommon commitment and dedication during the last two years of very intense training. Exploration is unforgiving and, it, and it's challenging. But these astronauts are prepared to propel humanity into the vast unknown, taking us farther than ever before. Today we recognize our new American astronauts as well as two Canadian astronauts who have trained alongside their NASA counterparts the entire way. The integration of U.S. and Canadian astronauts exemplifies the strength 
that will ultimately prove the Artemis generation successful. We are proud to work with all of our international partners in low Earth orbit, and we are very ex excited to extend these partnerships to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. Interestingly, these astronauts here were selected from more than 18,000 applicants, the most that have ever applied to the space agency. And they come from many walks of life. And they are joined by their Canadian classmates. They are the best of the best. They are highly qualified and very diverse, and they represent all of America. By receiving their pins today, these astronauts are eligible for all kinds of missions in the future. We're talking about missions to the International Space Station on the Commercial Crew Program. We're talking about missions in the Artemis Program to the Gateway. And we're talking about missions, no kidding, to the surface of the moon. And when we talk about the International Space Station and the Orion Crew Capsule, and we talk about the Gateway itself, these are all programs that are managed by an amazing team of engineers and scientists right here at the Johnson Space Center. This is all made possible with significant increases to the agency's budget as a result of President Donald Trump's Moon to Mars space policy and bipartisan support in the House and Senate. And I want to specifically thank Senators Cruz and Cornyn for your strong support, not only in authorization, but also in appropriation, and of course your great leadership for the Johnson Space Center in the state of Texas. Here's what we know. NASA can count on Texas, and when we get to the moon, it's because it happens here in the state of Texas. Now, I, I can tell you, I used to represent Oklahoma. <laughs> so I can also tell you, um, NASA has this unique ability to bring people together, bipartisan support, international support, and Oklahoma and Texas. So how about that? <laughs> NASA knows it can always count on Texas. So when we think about the future, there is no shortage of opportunities for these ama amazing candidates, not can well, I guess they're candidates for a few more minutes. Um, so this is a historic graduation, and this is the Johnson Space Center, the home of the astronaut corps, and so many great things are happening here. The technical expertise and skilled background of NASA employees at Johnson and across the agency is unmatched. Right here, we are mul running multiple new programs to take us to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. And Johnson Space Center is leading the way. One of my first initiatives as the NASA Administrator was the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. So not only are we going to the moon with amazing astronauts, but we're going to the moon robotically with scientific payloads, and those missions will, beginning, will start beginning as, sur as soon as early next year. NASA has also recruited numerous commercial and international partners to help propel us to a new era of human space exploration. We can expect even greater progress in 2020, and of course there is a whole lot more, mo more momentum coming in the years ahead. Remember this, in the year 2024, we are going to take not only the next man, but the first woman to the surface of the moon by direction of the President of the United States. The significance of being the first class in the Artemis generation cannot be understated. Artemis, in Greek mythology, is the goddess of the moon. She is also called the torchbringer. And we think about the light that you are going to bring not just to the United States of America, but to all of the world. We think about something absolutely significant and important. And when we think about Artemis, as, a, as, as, as the name of a program, the goddess of the moon, this time when we go to the moon, we go with a very diverse. 
highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women, and we are so proud of what you guys are going to achieve. We will use the Gateway, our space station in lunar orbit, to give us access to more parts of the moon than ever before. The Gateway is, in fact, a space station around the moon. The Orion crew capsule managed right here at Johnson is how our astronauts are going to get to the moon. And of course, they're going to launch there on the SLS rocket, the most powerful rocket ever built, which, by the way, is now core stage complete. It is on a barge heading to the Stennis Space Center for green run testing. There is going to be fire and smoke coming out of the back end of that thing very soon. And I, as your NASA administrator, am very excited about finally seeing that happen. So I want to extend my heartfelt congratulations to our newest astronaut class, the Turtles. I am confident that part of the astronaut generation, you will bring scientific and technological advantages and new things to this nation and in fact to the world that right now we can't even imagine. And now I'd like to introduce my friend, Reed Wiseman, who is an astronaut who spent 165 days on the International Space Station. He's done hundreds of science experiments on the International Space Station. And I will say even more important than the 165 days on the space station, Reed and I are both naval aviators, and we spent long more than 165 days on the USS Abraham Lincoln back in 2003. So welcome to the stage, my good friend, Reed Wiseman. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't really need to set the audience. This is a great day. There's a lot of motivation out there. There's a lot of love and support from the families of the turtles. You're going to hear turtles a lot. That's our, that's our class name for these fine 13. And, uh, and it brings us joy to say that word turtles, so I'll say it a few times. Um, we're happy to share this event with everyone here today. I love seeing the pictures from the school kids that you were holding up earlier. Hopefully we'll see more of those later. So relax, have fun, enjoy this. This should be a jovial, fun experience. So a little over two years ago, we brought in these, these 13 outstanding individuals from the absolute tops of their professions. And the video behind me is going to show a recap of their two years of training. This training was not meant to change who they are. Rather, it was meant to make them competent in their new profession, to give them an understanding of the many missions of our great space agency, and to hone their team skills for long duration space flight. That's going to be pretty important. It's demanding at times, and it's extremely broad in material. The turtles learn how to work together, fly in the T-38. They've learned spacewalking skills underwater in our neutral buoyancy lab just right up the road. They've learned about the International Space Station. They've studied the building blocks of Artemis, the Orion, Space Launch System, and the Gateway. And of course, they've learned how to operate the Canadian robotic arm. They visited all 10 NASA field centers across the country and learned about the role of each of our critical centers and how they play in NASA's missions. Aeronautics, rovers on Mars, satellites studying the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, missions reaching the furthest corners of our solar system and even beyond. They completed wilderness and water survival training as a team. They counted on each other time and again, both professional and personal, throughout these past two years. This foundation is going to prepare them for living and working in space, to be a part of the Artemis generation, and to contribute to our common goal of advancing humanity and continued research in low Earth orbit, a sustained presence on the moon, and then one day on Mars. Turtles, we love you. You are a great, great group of humans. We welcome your enthusiasm. You will all see that today, I promise. We welcome your passion. And most of all, we absolutely welcome your hunger for exploration knowledge. It is infectious, and we feel it every day here. And now, I have the personal privilege to welcome to the podium a three-time shuttle astronaut and truly the finest leader I have ever worked with, Pat Farster. Thanks, Reed. Uh, it is indeed an honor and most days a joy to lead the astronaut corps. Uh, 
I know our focus today is on this group that's on the stage, but I can't go any farther without recognizing uh, my colleagues, uh, the astronauts that are here. You can identify them by their blue flight jackets because they're the ones that have carried this torch uh, this far as we uh, bring new people into the office. I will tell you that when we go out and share what it's like to fly in space with people, we love that. But that's just to share the experience through words, maybe sometimes some pictures or videos. But it is so much fun when we bring a new group into the astronaut office and we know we're going to be able to sh share those actual experiences with them as we see them uh, go to space. It was probably just over 21 years ago when I was sitting in a seat uh, just like that at my own graduation. And there were a lot of similarities to that period of time as there are now. We were kind of on the cusp of the next big thing, uh, the International Space Station. And I remember there was no shortage of pictures, uh, artists rendering of what the space station would look like all around the Johnson Space Center uh, in cubicles and above desks uh, of most of the employees. And I remember looking at that picture and going, man, I don't know if we can really build this amazing thing in space. And now, 20 years later, we are celebrating uh, the actual uh, human presence on that space station for almost 20 years. And the reason I tell that story is because we are now on the cusp of something big with Artemis and going to the moon. And for some people, it may seem like it's something that can't be done, but I promise you that in 20 years, one of you is going to be standing up here telling of the adventures of going to the surface of the moon, of having those experiences and sharing those with the next generation. And I look forward to that. It really can happen if you just stay the course. Now, one of the things they wanted me to talk about was the pin that this, uh, the turtles are going to receive today. It's got quite a history, uh, all the way back into the early 60s with the original Mercury astronauts, uh, they all had a pin. It was uh, kind of uh, uh, a individual pin that just represented uh, the Mercury astronauts. And then as we moved into Gemini and Apollo, it was decided, and we brought more people into the office, it was decided that we needed a, a pin that would represent everybody in the astronaut corps. And you can see uh, a picture of it there. Uh, when we complete our training successfully, we get a silver pin. Uh, once an astronaut has flown in space, that is exchanged for a gold pin. Now, uh, just to give you a little history about that pin, it goes all the way back to, it's stayed relatively the same since 1963. There's one exception. I think people know Deke Slayton in the first class that uh, was medically disqualified from flying and he became the first chief of the astronaut office. Uh, after the Apollo 1 fire, the, the, uh, the wives, the spouses of those astronauts decided to uh, do something for him and they gave him an astronaut pin, a gold pin representing uh, the fact that, uh, you know, representing flown space flight and in place of the star or in the center of the star was a diamond. And they flew it on Apollo 11 and then presented it to him. That's been the only exception since then of what the pins look like. I'll tell one other brief story and it is uh, with Apollo 12. Alan Bean uh, had replaced C.C. Williams on that flight after C.C. Williams was killed in a T-38 accident. And uh, he carried C.C. Williams' pin and his own uh, to the surface of the moon, and he threw those in a crater before leaving. So I will tell you, if one of you are on the surface of the moon and you do find one of those pins, if you would leave it there, we would appreciate it. You'll get your own today. I want to close uh, with a quote uh, by Thomas Paine back in 1776, uh, and it goes something like this, that which is obtained cheaply, we esteem lightly. I hope when you receive your pen today, with everything you've done to earn it, that you esteem it greatly. 
And now I get to uh, turn the podium over to Jeremy Hansen. It's uh, really an honor to do that. He was the mentor and the supervisor of this class. There's a lot of people out here in the audience that had a lot to do with training this class. We are very good at teaching people how to fly in space. But there's one other important component that's very important to me, and that's character. And the person that gets the lead of brand new astronaut class in uh, is somebody that we trust to instill character in those individuals. And I can't think of anyone that could have done that better than Jeremy Hansen. Thank you, Pat. Those are generous words indeed. Let me start uh, this morning just by uh, saying a few words on behalf of the Canadian Space Agency President, Sylvain Laporte. He truly intended to be here today, but some travel complications prevented that. And I know he'd want me to start by welcoming uh, all our Canadian Space Agency employees that are watching online right now. So thanks for joining us today. Je vous souhaite bienvenue à tous les Canadiens qui nous joignent en ligne aujourd'hui. In fact, today we're continuing a long-standing tradition. So Josh and Jenny are Canadian astronauts on the stage are the fourth class that Canada has hired as astronauts. And thanks to the tremendous um, relationship we've had with NASA, all of those astronauts, all of those classes have trained right here at the Johnson Space Center, starting ba or dating back to 1983. And I have to tell you that Canada truly appreciates American space leadership. You have, you have set big goals, and by setting those big goals and inviting the international partners to participate, we have accomplished incredible things together. And once again, you're doing it. You're leading one more time. You're set a big goal with Artemis, and Canada is rallied by that and super excited and proud to have already fully committed to joining the program. We're already working on a next generation of space robotics to help enable the gateway for future lunar exploration. And by continuing to partner like we've done, we're going to pursue knowledge and we're going to bring back even greater benefits to humanity. And we're super proud to do that alongside of you. And as my, <clears throat> thank you. And in my role as class supervisor, I have to say it's been just an absolute honor. I, uh, it's been a journey for me. These are my subordinates, my colleagues, and my friends. And I, have to t I could speak at length about their, their dedication, their operational competence, their work ethic, um, but they just truly have excelled at everything we've asked them to do, and we have asked a lot, trust me, over the last two and a half years. But what I think is most relevant to share with you today, especially for the youth who are watching, is how remarkable their work has been in the area of team skills. And it's already been mentioned a couple times today, but it, in my mind, that is their biggest accomplishment. I, uh, I set out with the help of others to envision uh, opportunities for them to really invest in themselves and to push themselves in those areas. And I have to tell you, I'm so proud because they took that vision, they embodied it, but then they blew right past it, well beyond it. And in the end, I ended up learning more from them than I ever intended to teach. And I think that is just an extraordinary compliment uh, for the turtles. We, we here, here in, in the space program, we truly value those team skills because we, we recognize that, that those high-performing teams are what enable us to get the job done in space. Whether astronauts are working with the ground teams that are making it all possible or amongst themselves trapped in a tin can in the vacuum of space. And I watch the turtles truly dig into excellent communication skills where you're, you're truly trying to understand the perspectives and the challenges of other people that you're working with and then using all of that, being adaptive and creating solutions. And in the end, the turtles have earned my absolute trust and it would be nothing short of an honor to fly with absolutely any single one of them. So let me just end with, in the final analysis, I cannot, cannot imagine having seen anyone do it better than you. Well done, turtles. I think it's 
it's time to begin the process of pinning these new astronauts. Um, one pretty historic milestone that's not turtle related at all that I think is worth sharing just real briefly. Uh, and Pat just whisper, whispered it into my ear, how cool it is right now that Christina Cook on the International Space Station just yesterday went to 300 days in orbit on her. <laughs> but why that's important at this moment, right after what Jeremy just said, She's a rookie. This is her first mission. I mean, that is amazing. That is an amazing accomplishment, and uh, it's a true testament to her team skills as well. Okay, so let's uh, let's start the pinning process. I'd like to welcome back to the stage uh, Chief Astronaut Pat Forrester uh, from the Canadian Space Agency, Jeremy Hansen, our Administrator Jim Bridenstine, our Center Director Mark Geyer, and our Deputy Center Director Vanessa Weish. All right, for a little bit of admin for the audience and for those watching on TV, as I call each of, uh, of our beloved turtles up, uh, I've heard a rumor that one of your classmates is going to tell just a, a little story about the, why they want to explore the unknown with you. And as you know, succeeding in space requires technical smarts to complete the mission, to complete the research, but it also requires those critical team skills and perhaps a little levity uh, to live together off the planet in a secluded, amazing environment for months or years in a spacecraft. So I'm looking forward to hearing these stories, a little levity, and uh, we're gonna welcome each new astronaut individually. They'll come across to get their pins. And unlike college graduations and high school graduations and perhaps kindergarten graduations, <laughs> applause and expressions of excitement are absolutely welcome and desired. All right, NASA family and friends, our first astronaut, Kayla Barron. Morning, I'm Jasmine McBelly, and while, while there are many, many reasons I would absolutely love to explore space with Kayla, amongst them being I want my roommate back, <laughs> One of the things I admire most about Kayla is her willingness to stand up and speak the truth even when it's really difficult and when no one else wants to do it. I think that courage and integrity is really important in what we do. And so Kayla, whether I'm with you or not when you get to space, I can't wait to see all the amazing things you're gonna do up there. Lady. Ladies and gentlemen, our newest astronaut, Kayla Barron. Congrats, Kayla. Next, we have Zena Cardman. Good morning, I'm Jenny Seide Gibbons, and Zena's technical ability and operational insight will ensure that she's a success no matter what mission she is on. But the thing that excites me most about the idea of Z flying in space is what she's going to share with us when she looks back at our own planet. Now Z has this really unique ability to talk about our Earth in a way that is inspiring and poetic. And I think that when she is in whatever orbit we put her in, <laughs> and she comments on our Earth from her celestial vantage point, she will share some of the most beautiful things that any of us have ever heard. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our newest astronaut, Zena Cardman. Congrats, Zena. Next up, we have Raja Chari. Yeah. Um, 
I'm Jessica Watkins, and I would love to explore space with Raja because you can always count on him. You can count on him to get things done, small things, hard things, mundane things alike, and you can count on him to do them without being asked. You can count on him to believe in you when you need an advocate, to, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> um, you can uh, count on him to be there for you when you need him. You can count on him to volunteer for you when you need a karaoke partner. <laughs> but most of all, you can count on Grinder to put the needs of the team above his own every time. And I truly admire him for that. Ladies and gentlemen, our newest astronaut, Raja Chari. Next up, Matthew Dominic. I'm Laurel O'Hara. Pojo brings a lot of energy to our team. He is always looking for ways to make things better for all of us, and he is always definitely 100% in, in anything he does. He's the kind of person who, when his car breaks, gives it to two arguably novice mechanic friends just to give us the experience of working on it. <laughs> Pojo, you're a good friend, and you make training fun. Ladies and gentlemen, our newest astro astronaut, Matthew Dominic. I'll let their hands calm down for a second. Bob Hines. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kayla, and I would love to explore space with Farmer for a lot of reasons. He comes to us as a T-38 instructor pilot, and I've flown with him a lot of times, and he's proven himself to be an excellent pilot, but more importantly to me, a skilled and patient teacher to newbies, and somebody who makes sound decisions even when things aren't going according to plan. More importantly to me, though, he's an open and honest teammate who's always ready and willing to invest the time and energy needed to make sure every single member of our team is performing at their best. And he's always been there to help us along the way as we learn. Ladies and gentlemen, our newest astronaut, Bob Hines. Warren Hoberg. I'm Rajachari, and uh, the reason I'd want to go to space with Woody isn't just because he's brilliant, which he is, but it's because he carries his brilliance in such a way that you don't feel like you're an idiot when you're around him, which, <laughs> which I guarantee that 99% of the people in this room are compared to him. <laughs> Uh, the other great thing about Woody is he applies that brilliance across all phases of his life, whether it's in the outdoors where he basically saved half our class from getting severe hypothermia like it was no big deal, and then uh, on his very first uh, space station sim nonchalantly directed uh, the whole team through an emergency response like he'd done it a hundred times. So I can't wait to be assigned with you, Woody. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next newest astronaut, Woody Hoberg. <laughs> Johnny Kim. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joshua Kutrick of Canada. And as I was thinking about Johnny, it occurred to me that as a child, dreaming about how a NASA astronaut might live their life out, I think I was probably thinking of Johnny. Uh, to me, he is the perfect manifestation of service about self, 
of service to one's country, of service to the operational mission. Uh, he's relentless in his pursuit of self-study and preparation and training. He's very quick to put others' needs above his own. And importantly, he's always been the calm in the storm. He's always been the cool and the collected voice in some of the more stressful and chaotic training situations that were placed in as a group. So I would trust my life to him, and I'm very proud to call him my friend. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the newest NASA astronaut, Jonathan Kim. From the Canadian Space Agency, Josh Kutrick. I'm Zena Cardman. Josh was my first and most frequent partner in spacewalk training, and in that, as in all of our training, he makes it look easy with a calm competence. I think we'd be lucky to fly with him for his technical skills alone, but Josh also has a special talent for making his crewmates really feel empowered. He listens deeply and makes you feel truly heard. I think I trust him with my life just as I'd trust him to catch the most subtle jokes. Getting to see, <laughs> getting to see that twinkle in Josh Kutrick's eye really feels like the greatest compliment ever. <laughs> Josh, congratulations, you're excellent, and I'm lucky to call you a friend and a crewmate. Gentlemen, our newest astronaut, Josh Kutrick. <laughs> oh, he is so funny. Jasmine Mogbelly. I'm Johnny Kim. Dependable, compassionate, intelligent, resilient, and fierce. For all these reasons and more is why Jaws is the perfect crewmate I'd go into the void of space with. But the main reason, Jaws, why I'd go to space with you is because of your unwavering loyalty and integrity. I'm your Huckleberry any day. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your newest astronaut, Jasmine Mobelli. <laughs> Laurel O'Hara. I'm Frank Rubio, and I would love to go to space with Laurel. I've been fortunate enough to do uh, some really tough training with her, and I can tell you that she is incredibly smart. She is strong, uh, tough as nails, and she can run any of us into the ground. <laughs> Intellectually and physically, she's as good as it gets. But what you really need to know about Laurel is that she's kind, she's caring, and she laughs and smiles very easily. <clears throat> she has a heart of gold, and she's an incredible teammate. Ladies and gentlemen, your newest astronaut, Laurel O'Hara. <laughs> Frank Rubio. My name is Bob Hines. Uh, I, Frank and I had probably 80% of our training events together, so I got to know Frank pretty well over the last couple of years. And uh, 
He uh, is just one of the most genuinely humble, reliable, and honest people that you'll ever meet. Uh, and probably little known fact, uh, other than to those of us up here on stage, is that he is a friend to all animals. Uh, the general population of ducks and pelicans in the area is, uh, owns a lot of their lives in no small part to Frank and his family uh, for all the rescues that they do. So uh, on behalf of the animal kingdom, we thank you. <laughs> But Frank is truly a, uh, a wonderful person. He is a great American, an even better human being, and he's going to make an awesome astronaut. Uh, and I really look forward and hope I get the chance to go to space with him one day. Ladies and gentlemen, our newest astronaut, Frank Rubio. <laughs> From the Canadian Space Agency, Jenny Seide Gibbons. I'm Woody Hoberg. I would love to go to space with Jenny because she has this infectious curiosity about the world around her. It's been, I have so many fond memories from trips with Jenny and our engineering discussions, whether it's looking at a rocket and wondering, why is that beam there? or standing in an ice cream line calculating vortex shedding frequency, or just really seeing the optimism in all the small things in life. Jenny is an outrageously effective crew member. She's outrageously smart. She's outrageously fun to be around, and she's just going to be a fantastic crewmate. Ladies and gentlemen, our newest astronaut, Jenny Seide Gibbons. Jessica Watkins. I'm Matthew Dominic. Would I crawl into a small spacecraft for months at a time with Wadi? Absolutely. And I knew it on day one. I was running my mouth about something, and she immediately called me out for it. And I knew right then and there she was going to be an incredible teammate and colleague and friend. Nothing beats honest feedback on a team. She's talented. She's a natural operator. She's tough. She's not only the person you want to hang out with on a Friday night, I trust her with my life on the most daring of space flights. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest astronaut, Jessica Watkins. Ladies and gentlemen, one last applause for our newest astronaut class. Now that you are astronauts, is there anything your class would like to say? Sure, so there's uh, been a lot of clapping for us today, but we wanted to make sure on behalf of the Turtles that we, we clap for those who really deserved it. Uh, so first, uh, I want to thank those who put today together. Uh, anyone who's put together ceremonies like this knows they don't just happen magically. There's a lot of hard work that goes on beyond the scenes. Uh, so, you know, Steph Castillo, Lori Wheaton, Brandy, and Megan were just a handful of the people who've been answering emails and phone calls way later than they should. Uh, but I walked in yesterday before the rehearsal, and there was a, a group photo of the external relations team that was being taken for the people who, who put this together, and it filled this entire stage. Uh, so to those of you who helped do that, uh, thank you for making this a special day for us. Uh, 
Uh, next, I want to thank the instructors. Uh, the first kind of instructors are technical instructors. So we are the ones on the stage and they get to launch, but we're just symbols. Uh, symbols for you at JSC, the NASA centers, and really around the world. Uh, we're not up here because we were amazing. We're up here because you were amazing. There's not a, a fastener that gets turned on the station without you, a flight in the T-38 that happens without you, a uh, spacewalk that doesn't happen with years of training in the NBL without you, or even conversations in Russian, which are frustratingly difficult, without you. <laughs> Uh, so if you are one of the folks that instructed, taught, or interacted with us in this past two and a half years, if you could please stand up so we can recognize you. And, and Jeremy, you're a special kind of instructor. Uh, you're in, in a friendly way. Uh, <laughs> You've been a, a mentor to all of us, a role model and a friend, and I think we can all honestly say, I, I know for myself, I will never end a debrief ever in the rest of my life without thinking to myself, I could have done better. <laughs> uh, and finally, and most importantly, uh, the, the other kind of instructors that we have are life instructors. And so for all the folks uh, here in the family section in the red seats and those watching at home, uh, actually if the folks in the red, the red section want to stand up so we can, we can talk about you, that's you in this. <laughs> area. So, so we, we all would not be here if it wasn't for you. We wouldn't have started this program without you, and uh, it's even more important that we wouldn't have finished this program, even more so than with the technical instructors, we definitely wouldn't have finished without you. Um, you guys definitely have the harder job than us, and we know we, NASA, the, the world, will not go to the moon and beyond uh, without your guys' continued support. Um, like I said, you, you've had the harder job than any of us on this stage, whether it was raising and supporting us to be the people we are today, whether it's siblings who kept us in line along the way, or whether it's families who've lived with us being our better halves all this time, or probably even harder, the families living without us, uh, not just this past few years, but for decades, whether it's flying, living underwater, uh, combat deployments, uh, month-long expeditions to the Antarctic, Yosemite, uh, volcanoes, or wherever we hatched up some scheme that we thought it'd be a great idea to go for a while. <laughs> So while we had to go on expeditions that uh, made us better at our jobs, you guys made us better at our lives and being better people. So thank you very much for that and for getting us here and the country. So we now have a very special message from some folks that were not able to be with us here today. So let's, uh, let's roll, the, roll the message. Hello, Turtles, and congratulations on this momentous milestone for all of you. We're sorry we couldn't be there to celebrate this achievement with you in person today, but we've been busy up here on the International Space Station getting it ready for you guys to arrive and continue doing lots of science, spacewalks, and upgrades you're going to love the view looking down at our beautiful Earth and out at the moon. We know that all of the training needed to become an astronaut isn't easy, so take a moment to be proud of yourselves and how far you've come. We are certainly proud of you. We can tell you for sure the destination is so worth the wait. We're excited for you to officially join us as we work together to accomplish amazing things, fly new spacecraft, and prepare to head back to the moon. Congratulations again, and enjoy this special time with your families and this unmatched team. Look beside you. Your fellow classmates are also your future crewmates. The sky and the stars lie ahead. We also have two very special guests with us here today, two people that are critically important to the success of NASA, the success of the Johnson Space Center in Texas, 
We're thrilled that they're here with us, Senators Cornyn and Cruz, and we're going to give them an opportunity to come up and say a few words. We'll start with Senator Cornyn. I just want to say thank you for your leadership on appropriations and authorization. I also want to thank you um, for the Advancing Human Space Flight Act, which is bipartisan, introduced last year, and it is focused on improving and, and benefiting the International Space Station and, of course, uh, human space suits, and of course, human space suits are managed where? Right here at the Johnson Space Center. Senator Cornyn, come on, come on up. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Ambassador Bridenstine, Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for your hospitality. Uh, it is more than an honor for me and Senator Cruz and I and our colleagues to join you today in this incredible ceremony and this incredible celebration. I know there's some times in our lives that we will never forget that sort of seem to be those landmarks in our, in our long life, hopefully. Uh, that we will never forget. One for me, of course, as for many of you, was in uh, 1969 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin went to the moon and uttered the uh, famous phrase, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, and inspired us all. Well, I know this isn't the first graduation for uh, these astronauts, and some of, for some of you, apparently, it's not your second or third graduation. Uh, you've got a lot more than that. But suffice it to say, this is an incredibly smart group of individuals and um, who spent the last two years gaining the skills and knowledge to lead human space exploration into the future. I think I can speak for all of us here and, uh, and saying how proud we are of, of all of you and what you will accomplish. We heard earlier about the training program that uh, these astronauts have been through. It reminds me of a great quote from the movie The Right Stuff when Alan Shepard responds to a NASA recruiting pitch saying, sounds dangerous, count me in. <laughs> Well, to, to me, the, the amazing thing about our space program is, is its capacity to inspire all of us, young and old and in between. And I remember what uh, President Ronald Reagan said following the Challenger tragedy and the amazing speech. But the uplifting part of that was when he said, we've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States space program has been doing just that. We've grown used to the idea of space, and, per, and perhaps we forget that we've only just begun. We are all still pioneers. Well, I know these astronauts share that same conviction and enthusiasm. And I think the excitement we're all feeling today is only matched by our high expectations for all of them. And Minister Bridenstine, everybody here at the Johnson Space Center, and of course to the President Trump and Vice President Pence, have, none of them have been shy about pointing to the stars and setting lofty goals for America's space exploration program, and the Artemis program is just part of that. Folks used to tell kids when I was growing up, reach for the moon. But that's not the objective anymore. Now we've got to revise it to reach for Mars. Because that's what our space program is doing. And there's a good chance that at least one of you will take us there. Just as your predecessors have done before you, each of you will help fill the pages of history with human achievements in space. For generations, the United States has been the world leader in space exploration, and the Johnson Space Center will always be the heart and the home of human spaceflight. After all, the first words spoken on the moon's surface were, was Houston. This is where you'll find thousands of dedicated public servants and contractors willing to do the work to get our astronauts into, safe, into space, and most importantly, to bring them home safely. I'm in absolute awe of the work being done by the folks here at Johnson Space Center every day 
and the commitment to maintaining our place in the forefront of human space exploration. This community makes our nation proud and inspires millions of young students like those here today among us to know that the impossible can be possible. The 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission last summer was a reminder of just how far our space missions have come since that first small step. And Buzz Aldrin is still around telling us all about it 50 years later. The fact that we've just heard from colleagues of yours who are orbiting 220 miles above us in the International Space Station is proof of that. I have no doubt that these newly minted astronauts in front of us are going to accomplish, accomplish some incredible things so that our children, our grandchildren, and maybe even our great-grandkids will have a lot more to celebrate in the next 50 years. Once again, congratulations, astronauts, and Godspeed. We have another senator from the great state of Texas, somebody who is a leader in the Senate on space issues, and of course I saw him firsthand work very hard to create bipartisan legislation, the NASA Transition Authorization Act, to make sure that we had continuity of purpose as we go from one administration to the next. And of course, he's also the chairman of the Space Subcommittee in the Senate. I would also say uh, he has a, a very personal connection to NASA, and maybe even before NASA existed. His mother was, in fact, working at the time for the Smithsonian Institute as a human calculator when Sputnik got launched, and she was responsible for making sure the United States of America knew what this little thing was doing out in space. Uh, so, uh, even better than that, his mom is, an, is a mighty rice owl, I'm a little biased, hoot. <laughs> Senator Ted Cruz. That was a fearsome hoot there, Jim. <laughs> this is exciting. This is really exciting. Look, I was here two years ago when the turtles started, when y'all were first announced, when you were beginning the training. I remember visiting with each of you when you were getting started to be the first Artemis class. And I gotta say, I was blown away then and just sitting listening to the presentation. You know, there's a technical term for these men and women, and that's badass. <laughs> I suspect I was not the only one, as you were listening to their backgrounds, who felt horribly, horribly inadequate. Um, I did turn to John Cornyn and say, what the heck have we been doing with our lives? I, I mean, Johnny, you're a Navy SEAL with a degree from Harvard Medical School. That's just ridiculous. I mean, he can kill you and then bring you back to life. and do it all in space. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of young people who are here who are watching at home. And you think about when young people envision, what do I want to do in life? You get kids sitting around and some may say, I want to be a fireman. Others might say, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a scientist. I want to be a ballerina. I want to be a superhero. And the answer that trumps all of those is I want to be an astronaut. Because these guys with these training, they're going to have to do every bit of that. Every one of those, whether it is dancing in space, in a spacewalk, dealing with a disaster, which unfortunately in the harsh realities of space, disaster is one of the things you count on. Potentially saving the lives of your crew members. Think how many of them, when talking about their colleagues said, I would trust my life to them. In most walks of life, you don't have to worry about that too much. In most jobs, look, frankly, 
The Senate, the only thing I have to worry about is someone giving me a paper cut. <laughs> but for these guys, trusting your life to the men and women next to you is exactly what they're doing. And I have to say, these men and women embody the hopes and future. Think about little boys, little girls, going back from the dawn of time. Before we had airplanes, before we had automobiles, before we discovered the wheel, before we discovered fire, little boys, little girls stared up at the sky, looked at the stars, looked at the moon, said, what's out there? Who's out there? What is in the great beyond? That's what these men and women are charged with. It's almost like you could reach out and touch the moon. <laughs> By the way, your toys are a lot better than just about all the rest of ours. <laughs> but those hopes and dreams, you know, there are young people watching this today that you too could be an astronaut. You too can explore the great frontier. Let me just say as a final thing. You know, I do enjoy the power of space to bring people together. To cause my dear friend Jim Bridenstine, a diehard Okie, to stand up here and praise Texas effusively. <laughs> There's something deeply beautiful about that, Jim. <laughs> to bring together Look, this is a crazy political time, lots of partisan divisions, and yet for the six years I've chaired the Space Subcommittee in the Senate, we've seen bipartisan cooperation when it comes to space. We've seen Republicans and Democrats working together on space. And I want to say where we are right now, my hometown of Houston, all of Texas, but especially Houston, has a, a special and a deep connection to space. It was just a few miles away at Rice University where John F. Kennedy stood and promised, within a decade, we will send a man to the moon and bring him back safely. By the way, Kennedy, in that same speech, he said, why do we do so? We do so for the same reason that Rice plays Texas. <laughs> Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. You look at the city of Houston, our sports teams celebrate space. We have the Rockets, we have the Astros. As John mentioned, one of the very first words said on the surface of the moon was Houston. The eagle has landed. And what I'm so excited going forward with Artemis is that when the next astronaut lands on the moon, maybe one of these men and women, and by the way, as the father of two daughters, I could not be more excited that we will land a woman on the moon and bring her home safely. When that, that next astronaut lands on the moon, once again, one of the very first words spoken will be Houston. And when that next astronaut lands on the surface of the red planet Mars, once again, that for one of those first words spoken will be Houston and the city of Houston, the state of Texas, the entire country and the entire world will be at your back. Congratulations. We're proud of you and we love you. Okay, um, why does Rice play Texas? I'm gonna tell you why. Because we win. That's why. I was on the sidelines in 1994, and it was 19 to 17 Rice over Texas. Might, might have been a little bit after that speech you just mentioned, but we got it done. 
Okay, so we are joined here today with about 100 students from the area. And some of them have come with questions for our astronauts. And then we're going to actually go to social media and ask a few questions from social media. So today we have, and if you would, when I call your name, if you would stand up and then I'll go ahead and get to your question. We have Sienna, a fourth grader from Davila Elementary School. We have Derek, a fourth grader from Wesley Elementary School. And we have Julian, an eighth grader from DD Middle School. Okay, so the question from Sienna, fourth grader from Davila Elementary School. Number one, she says, congrats to NASA on the first all-female spacewalk. How do the new women astronauts here today feel about that momentous occasion? And what are you most looking forward to about going into space in the future? All right, thank you, Sienna, for the congratulations as well. Um, so I think Jessica and Christina's spacewalk a couple months ago was, was pretty meaningful to everyone on this stage. I mean, at the very least, it was two outstanding astronauts doing their job incredibly well, which is always wonderful to see. But I know that we all also recognize the significance of that moment, both in the context of our space program, but also I think as a sign of the incredible progress that you can make when you include everyone in your mission and you back it 100%. So I think that was, that was powerful for everyone who was sitting here, but also powerful for everyone watching. I don't know if Sienna, if you watched that spacewalk, all the boys and all the girls at home who watched, I think that that was meaningful. So looking forward at our own space flight, I think we're gonna take that motivation and that inspiration. And I can say the thing I'm most excited for is to be able to be in a crew with some of my, hopefully, some of these amazing people with me on this stage, my incredible classmates, incredible people who are in our office already. And we just look forward to making a contribution like Jessica and Christina did and the rest of that, that wonderful expedition. Derek, uh, a fourth grader from Wesley Elementary School asks, how long will astronauts be on the surface of the moon during the Artemis missions? Derek, I'm Matt, and I really like that question because I think you'll find the answer really cool. Artemis is going to stay. The administrator talked a little bit about the infrastructure we're building to make that happen, but how can you not see this moon up here all day and want to walk all over it? So we're building a space station that's gonna orbit the moon. That will allow us to go to the surface and back to that gateway. That's an outpost that also provides the stepping stone to get us to Mars. But we're going to stay. We're building the sustainable infrastructure to make that happen, Derek. And that should be really cool. But it's not gonna be easy. It's gonna take two things. It's gonna take a lot of hard work and the things that your teachers talk about all the time. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Americans and international partners in those fields working hard together to reach those goals. And we'll, sell, we'll tell the same story that NASA has told for decades. When we work hard, we achieve new heights and new goals. We develop new solutions, new, new, new technologies for everyone on Earth. And the second part is we need the resources. And we make a really cool team when we put these two things together. Americans and international partners working hard together with resources from our elected officials. We come together and we achieve these new goals. Awesome. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about walking around on this thing. But Derek, this is exciting for you. This is exciting for you because if I stood up here right now and told you we were only going to go for a couple days, you're in fourth grade and you'd miss it. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is we're going to stay. And what that means is after you work hard in school, you're going to join us on the moon and join us on Mars.
Matthew, you just became not just one of our newest astronauts, but you're also now our TV personality. <laughs> Julian, eighth grade, DD Middle School, wants to know, was there ever a time you doubted yourselves? <laughs> Take that one. Is there ever a time you doubted yourselves? And if you say no, well, Matthew probably would say no. Nobody else would say no. Um, and, and if so, how did you overcome it? Hi, Julian. I'm Johnny, and I'd love to answer that question. It's a great one. Everyone standing before you today on this stage has had self-doubt. It is very human to doubt yourself. The greatest self-doubt I had was when I showed up to SEAL training, and I didn't know if I had what it took to become a Navy SEAL. But because of my teammates, we made it through. And that opened up my eyes that you, Julian, everyone in this auditorium, everyone watching is capable of so much more than they think they are. So when we showed up here, we all had our doubts. But we knew we had each other, the support of our friends, our families, our teachers, and that's why we're standing before you today. Would you be willing to share, um, I know you guys are called the Turtles and gals are called the Turtles. Where did that name come from and what does that specifically mean? So when we were announced by Vice President Pence a couple of years ago, he made a metaphor that if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. <laughs> and that's what we are here today. Every person on stage here is a symbol of all the love and support that we've had from our friends, our mentors, our teachers. We wouldn't be here without all that love and support. So thank you. Okay, now we're gonna go to some social media questions. Sam on Twitter asks, how have your families been with your plans? Are they supportive? <laughs> They're all here, so we're gonna... Um, <laughs> Did they think you were crazy? Uh, who helped you the most? Okay, well that's a great um, multi-part question. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Sam is actually my husband's name, so I'm starting to question if he wrote this, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Johnny actually just talked about the, our name, the turtles, and while behind the scenes it incites a lot of jokes about us being slow. It, it is really about all those people who support us. For me personally, um, my parents, my, you know, my dad's here today, my mom's watching on TV. Um, they've always believed in me and they've always showed me uh, what you can accomplish through hard work. And f for me, having my parents believe I could do something that convinced me. I was like, well, if they think I can do it, I can do it. And I, I think it was so important. Now, were there ever um, people that doubted me? Absolutely, there were. Um, you know, when, when I decided to join the Marine Corps, after graduating from MIT, um, now in a post-September 11 world, did my parents think I was crazy? Yes, I'm pretty sure they did. Um, but, but once I joined, they, they gave me absolute support. Um, support from my brother came in a slightly different form of, um, you know, giving me a little grief anytime he didn't think I was living up to my potential or doing my hardest. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned my husband Sam, I haven't even been married three months, but I, I can't tell you in that three months and the time we've been together how much of a force multiplier he's been at home. Um, and, and it's, it's because of that that I'm here today, and I think everyone feels similarly. But, but that being said, there, 
there will always be people out there that doubt you. You know, when I was a sixth grader and said I was going to become an astronaut, do you think everyone was like, yep, she's going to become an astronaut? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Um, so at the end of the day, you have to believe that you're doing what, what you love doing, and that will be enough to get you through. You're going to fail at some point, but just keep going. So Bella on Twitter asks, what was something about training that totally surprised you? So Bella, that's a great question. I'm uh, Woody Hoberg. I think one thing that I didn't fully appreciate until I arrived here at Johnson was just all of the cool things that we're doing in space every day. We've been operating and uh, living on the International Space Station for almost 20 years now. And for most of the students, some are not, excuse me, for all, um, probably all of the students in the audience, that means uh, that there has not been a day in your life when we have not had men and women living and working in space. I think that's just... <clears throat> I think that's just an amazing, truly amazing accomplishment. And when I'm here at Johnson, I still love just walking into mission control any hour of any day and watching our team here on the ground controlling the vehicle, operating it, and enabling the amazing science mission that we're continuing to fulfill today. Ellie's question on Twitter, what thing did you do during astronaut school that a six-year-old like me might have thought was impossible? I am uh, Bob Hines and Ellie, that's a great question. Um, I would say the entire thing, I think uh, other than Jaws maybe, uh, every single one of us would look at the fact that we're on this stage back when we were six years old as potentially being impossible. Uh, back when I was six, uh, that was a long time ago, uh, but I, I, I had just turned six when the first space shuttle launch uh, happened, and I remember watching that, and that being my first thing that really got me interested in space, and, uh, and it just seemed so big. And I, I've told this before, that if anyone ever told me what I wanted, or asked me what I wanted to be when I was young, it was always a pilot, because being an astronaut was not even on the table uh, for me for exactly that reason. Um, however, what do you do when you encounter impossible things, right? And I think that's an important question. I tell it to my kids, and they're probably going to roll their eyes over here as soon as I start talking. Um, but when you encounter something that you think is impossible, you break it down into small little things, and you start taking and chipping away at those things, and suddenly it doesn't become or seem so impossible. Uh, back in 1962, Senator Cruz alluded to it. Uh, when President Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely to the Earth, the entire planet thought that was impossible. And less than 10 years later, we did exactly that. And now we're looking at going back, and we're going to put our first woman and our next man on the moon, and we're going to do the same exact thing. Now back to these small little problems, and how do you break them down? You break them down in these small things, and then you try. The kids, back to you guys. <laughs> You try, and when you try, you don't just give it a half-hearted effort, you try your absolute best, and you put your best towards it. The reason a lot of people don't try for things is because they're afraid to fail. We learn more from our failures than we ever do from our successes. Some smart guy said that a long time ago, uh, and it's absolutely true. Successes are great, don't be afraid of the failures, learn what you can, and then each time you try and you take one of those steps, you take another step and you take another step. And what happens when you put steps together? They become a journey. And we at NASA call those journeys exploration. And that exploration is what we're all up here to do and what all the people in the audience are out here to help us uh, do to accomplish these great goals that we're putting in front of us. So just remember that no great leap has ever been accomplished without first taking a small step. Awesome. Bob, you made a, a, a great point about 1962 and the audacious goal that was set before the nation. And everybody thought it was impossible. 
including people that were surrounding President Kennedy at the time, thought he was crazy for making that audacious declaration um, in the House of Representatives. But here's the thing we have today that we didn't have in 1962. Number one, we've got the Johnson Space Center. We have, we, yes. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to think that the infrastructure that was required to make that happen didn't even exist back then, and yet he still declared it so. And of course, it rallied a nation and it made it happen. That is, in fact, why dates are important. And when we think about what we have now with all of the launch infrastructure and all of the mission control infrastructure, the great scientists and the engineers and all of the know-how and understanding that we have today, we are, in fact, going to make this happen to land the next man and the first woman on the moon by 2024. I will also say that this astronaut class has an opportunity to fly in the very near future back to the International Space Station on American-built rockets under the Commercial Crew Program. So we think about Commercial Crew, we think about the SLS system, the Orion Crew Capsule, the Gateway, and now for the first time since the 1960s, we have funded a human landing system to get from the orbit around the moon down to the surface of the moon to the tune of $600 million. Thank you so much to the senators for helping make that happen. And all of that environmental control, life support system capability, the human to machine interface and your input on those systems in fact, you guys are going to be involved in helping design those systems. And we are grateful for your service and that, all that work on those programs will be done right here at the Johnson Space Center. Know this, we have a lot under development. We have more under development right now at NASA than at any point in NASA's history. And that gives you, number one, a lot of opportunity. And it gives us a lot of responsibility. Um, and of course, our goal, and I'm saying this for the families, we have one highest priority that is over every other priority, and that is your safety. We are gonna build the absolute best, absolute safest capability with the support from our legislators to make sure that not only you go to the moon or to the International Space Station, and maybe one of you will go to Mars, but you come home safely, because that is the ultimate objective. We care about you, we love you, to think about what you're about to do to inspire this nation, to inspire these young folks, it is astonishing. And we think about the people that came before you. You know, we think about, I'll tell you, my first memory of something significant that happened in space, I was in fifth grade, and Mrs. Powers came in, and she was crying because of the Challenger incident. And they rolled in the TVs, and we all watched with astonishment. But here's the thing. I'm the first NASA administrator in history that wasn't alive when we put Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. That, that is a failure of this nation. And we cannot let another generation go by where we don't have people living and working on another world. I want people to remember exactly where they were, as I remember exactly where I was. I want people to remember exactly where they were when under the Artemis program, this generation, the Artemis generation, landed the next man and the first woman on the South Pole of the Moon. Ladies and gentlemen, if today hasn't inspired you enough, I want you to know this. There's a lot of people watching online, maybe on NASA TV, young folks that are here in the audience. In the spring, listen to me, this is gonna make news. You need to be a part of it. We are going to have applications being accepted for a new astronaut class. And you guys are blazing the trail for the Artemis generation. So if you are interested, NASA.gov, NASA.gov. Look for the new information on how ultimately you might one day also become an astronaut. That announcement will be coming in the spring. So in closing, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you will do. Not just me and NASA, but the entire nation is grateful. Let's come up for one final picture and then and we'll do it just with the astronauts at first and then we'll have everybody else join. So come on up, final picture.